capital soon. Yeah, right. Mr. Speaker, the Diaco. Vediaco. 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 Can you explain, tell us a little bit more about this contest? I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, this, this contest. Yeah, well, you know, I do a couple media projects with colleges, and this particular project was done with the University of Maryland College Park, where students were asked to monitor local radio stations and then, you know, file complaints based on what the FCC states is indecent. And, you know, somebody was like, you know, I heard the DJ at like 5 o'clock talking about this website. And, you know, this is when kids are listening, you know. This is when the middle schooler is calling up, giving shout-outs to his friends and everything. So he's a little taken back. And here's a 19-year-old concerned about this. And he said, well, you know, do we complain to the FCC about this? And I'm like, sure, did you go to the website? Let's check it out. And we went to the website, we were kind of freaked out by it because it's basically porn. You know, there was no restrictions. There was no, like, you know, even the minimal pop-up that says you have to be 18 didn't even pop up. And, you know, for them to tell us that, you know, contacting Virgin, this wasn't about sex. I mean, some of these girls, you don't even see their underwear, you know, and some of them are, like, looking in the camera and taking a picture of their butts in the mirror. And it's, it's you know, it just takes you back, and you're like, this is allowed to happen. And they want to keep telling us, like, uh, it's not about sex. It's, you know, just a song about booty. You know, except that it was a white rapper, and, and in the video it's mostly black women and their butts, and it's a silly song. And so, um, you know, we complained. Um, the uh, website then went up with, a, you know, the little 18 over thing, but you can't keep kids, you know, off that. And the fact is, all the DJs, you know, in the area were mentioning the website. So somehow there was some promotion that it was just like, hey, go to MissNewBooty.com. I mean, the website's not even up now. They took it down, and it goes right to the rapper's webpage if you, if you try to uh, access it. But this is, this is part of a whole bunch of things. Uh, the local radio station here, the Clear Channel one, the, the Top 40 music, uh, had the breast year ever. They have an over 20 share of 12 to 17 year olds that, that listen to the radio station. You never hear the radio stations bragging about, you know, we have a 20 share in 17, 12 to 17 year olds. They only brag about their 18 to 34 or their 25 to 54, whatever it is. And in reality, all the hip hop stations have double digits, usually in the 20s, for kids. And this is what they're. The songs that you're hearing on the radio, the ones that David Banner was talking about that he did called Play, that the clean version, the clean version on the radio is talking about cleaning in your thong and playing with your clit. You know, these are the songs that are on the radio. I don't know what slice of life. It's just like only the strip club slice of life is being reflected in the music that we're hearing on the radio. Like, you never hear anything else. Like, there's... There, like there isn't anything else and one of the reasons you didn't have a female hip-hop artist is because those record executives aren't signing them the other thing that David Banner didn't say and, I, and he kind of said but didn't say when his when he talked about his music career going down the hill he was told we need a hit song and we want something like the whisper song the whisper song was a huge song with the, the hook was wait till you see my dick and sorry for the, the, the language, but this is what our kids are hearing, you know, we should be upset. And the mm -hmm. fact is, his song is very much like that song, and it went, and he was right. It was about dollars, and it went straight up. And that's what the executive said that they wanted, and that's what they got, and he made money, and they made money. And, and this is, this culture keeps going. But what happens with the females, MC Light can't get a deal. Lauren Hill can't get a deal. Method Man made a song that, question BET, do you think they're going to play that? No. You know, nothing that, that um, talks about white men or questions their authority gets airplay on the radio or um, supported by the record labels. But when we want to talk about each other, killing each other, devaluing education, that's okay. Again, just like the book, which I read and I love, uh, The Black Image in the White Mind, it talks about basically we're entertainment for this it, and it makes sense when you're talking about how is that so that the, you know, white, whites are buying more music, they're, they're the larger population. 
And the fact is, there's another uh, study by Me Productions that said even our kids don't really even like hip hop after a certain age. Like when they get to be like 19, they start loving R&B more than they they like hip hop. So you know, it's not about us. We are the entertainment. You know. Well, how do you deal with the images of, say, uh, a Common or uh, a Kanye West? How? What is the underpinning and the rationale for their um, success these uh, would hip the hard hip hop art artists. But what is happening, if, if I had $18 million in my marketing budget, like 50 Cent had, then I'd be the number one rapper too. You know, when I was in the music industry, you know, the common thing is if you if they play it, they will listen. The fact that they can't even get on the radio, their, their record labels aren't putting money behind them, you know, Kanye is great because he made a kind of a niche for himself. He, because he's controversial, makes him popular, and it's great. Um, Common, you know, he's he's still on the on the you know kind of underground tip, as they say. You know, he's getting more um, exposure, but his record company doesn't put a lot of money behind him. Most Def, The Roots. You know, their record labels aren't supporting them like they're supporting the young jocks and little Jeezys and little Waynes and all these 50 Cent and all these other folks. They're not getting the same dollars. And so it, it's all about marketing. If you can get on MTV, um, and, and, and MTV Viacom sets the standard. It, it, it's at a point where if you get on BT or MTV, then radio will follow. You can look at billboards and you can track it. It, 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 it falls in line with each other. And it's not about sales. So you you, you kinda explained to me you know, I'm, I was always I wonder what happened to Lauren. You know, she was one of my favorites and I just you know she's still out there. She's still out there and uh, Erica Badu is uh, Oh yeah, she's Jill Scott released today. Yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, uh N D R E I understand that she's not promoted is that, is that? She's still out there. They're all they're all still there and, and most of them have realized that why should I be with a record label when they're not going to support me I might as well go independent and actually I would suggest that all um, artists go independent because they don't make money selling records record executives make money from um, these artists selling records they make money from all their endorsement deals so the whole thing is the record, they don't need the record industry. I, I worked Scarface and I worked at uh, Capital EMI Records. And you know what? We never took them to radio. We didn't really have the internet, internet at that time. It's around 95. And uh, we always went to the club with his music. That's where it went. His music, quote unquote, wasn't appropriate for radio because of the public airwaves. And because we weren't in the heat of consolidation, record, I mean, radio stations wouldn't play him. And you know what? He went gold and platinum every time. You do not need radio airplay to sell records. You, you know, and, and he was doing it without, with club and, and name recognition. And now that you have the internet, you don't, you can bypass all of this um, need to be on public airwaves. Well, Dr. Dale, um uh, in your testimony, you state that the research on violent hip hop vid videos increases adversarial sexual beliefs of both, both men and women and an acceptance of relationship violence. You know, how strong is this correlation? And, you know, is this in any way disputed by other research? Uh, you also state that research shows that violent music lyrics lead to more aggressive thoughts and feelings. Does this translate into some of the aberrant behavior that society is, in, is, 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 in, is reeling from now, in, particularly in certain urban communities? I'd say a couple of things about that. First, the research on hip-hop and video games as they evolve, there is less of that than there's research on other forms of media such as television and movies simply because uh, they've been around for a longer period of time. And I do think that it's, um, as we're beginning to see changes in each media, we need to continue to watch what the effects of each of those forms is. But yes, theoretically underlying all these different forms of media, when you look at um, either stereotypical messages or you look at violent messages, it's been well documented over time. And I think mainstream psychology 
we don't dispute that there, are, um, that there is a clear effect going on there. You asked me if people would dispute it. Um, as I say, I don't think mainstream psychologists would, but it, the industry seems to always be able to find someone out there who is a psychologist who will you know, speak for their side. So I've learned in my career as a media psychologist that there's always controversy following it, but in my estimation, there's strong evidence out there of um, an important link between those factors. There seems to be a nexus between the uh, culture that you spoke to, and I agree with you, you can turn the television off, but you can't turn the culture off. There seems to be a correlation between the culture of violence, uh, degradation, misogyny, uh, sexism, and the drug culture. Is there a linkage? Have you looked at any linkage between the drug culture, which leads to penitentiary, penitentiary culture that comes back out on the street. I mean, it seems like this is a cyclical kind of, uh, uh, of um, deterioration that we're, that we're engaged in as a society and as a community. Is that? I haven't looked at um, uh, drug culture per se. I know that people have analyzed rap music and found that to be a common theme along with criminality and sexuality as we've been talking about here today. But I would underline that there is definitely a link between the stereotypical content and the aggressive content. And I was noticing today during the testimony of the artists that they called for uh, the ability to express themselves, but I think that it's all part of a power dynamic, that if you're in a marginalized group, you look for someone else who's below you on the hierarchy to marginalize um, in order to lift yourself up, unfortunately. So what we didn't hear in that discussion is they want to express themselves, but at the cost to what other groups, at the cost to black women in their communities, for example. So I think it really is about power. And the drug factor may well be tied into a feeling of powerlessness, but as I say, I'm not an expert on that aspect. Dr. Whitting and Whiting, and I'm going to conclude, but discuss with me, I think, the issue and with the committee, the issue of power and powerlessness as a dynamic in this whole um, hip hop degradation, uh, the language that we're discussing and the images that we're discussing today. I think um, what Dr. Deal said is is absolutely on point um, in terms of and what the and what I heard from the the second the second panel and what I consistently heard repeated was this desire to express. Uh, the turmoil, the degradation, the poverty um, in the communities as a kind of uh, artistically rap music. This is what is going on in our hood. But when um, the congresswoman from Illinois asked, well, what is the impact on women? Uh, the, the, the argument just kept coming back to what's going on in our hood and we need to do something about that. And what expressly came through was that women could be sacrificed as long as the larger, more important issue was laid out on the table, poverty, um, police brutality, um, drive-bys, et cetera, et cetera. What I have found um, is, or well, what I think is particularly fascinating is the ways in which, as I said, the, the, the cost to black women, women in general, because it's not just me, what we have to conceive is that hip hop is a global phenomenon it is multi-racial, um, and its impact um, is, is felt, it, 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 you know, it's pervasive, um, uh, as well as other forms in, in, of sexism and misogyny in the culture, so hip-hop is certainly not alone. Um, what I think is very interesting, what I, what I saw coming through more than anything, is as one is describing the deprivation and the degradation um, and the self-hate, et cetera, that are going on in various communities, um, as kind of wrapping their reality or even fictionalizing um, for performing for the marketplace. What I think is more troubling and what I, I, I think comes through is that if this is the way that women are being perceived or if this is the way that women's lives are being characterized in this music, then women are, then the, the lives of women and the experiences of women in their communities is one that is quite devastating. And so, if nothing else, then we will take the music as being instructive. 
um, and therefore we need to do something about the ways in which women are being treated in those communities. Um, so if it means, if, if wrapping one's reality, um, it means it, it, it's exposing the very forlorn experiences that women um, are undergoing in their communities, then we need to do something about that. Then, then obviously young black women and girls are, are suffering a great deal in those communities. And I, I want to kind of conclude as well by saying, getting back to the kind of the, 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 the bitch ho thing and the censorship thing, there's a song by DMX, and, and I have to say, it's a guilty pleasure for me, uh, <laughs> as it's the chronic. Um, but there's a song by DMX on the, the album, and then there was X, and, and he says, you know, he has a line in there, if you have a daughter over 15, I'm a raper. Now, one does not mention bitch or hoe or nigger in that line, but one has certainly described something that's absolutely visceral um, and, and violent and troubling. And so we have to get beyond the beats and the rhymes. We have to really think about what's going on in the music and how it's impacting people's lives. Because if nothing else, as I said, it's instructive. Oh boy. Um, I'm, I'm just, um, uh, to a certain extent, I, I'm, I'm familiar and I'm not shocked, but I'm fabricated. You know, because um, in my community, I live in the hood. I live right next to a public house. I, I mean, my church, my pastor's church, is right in the heart of the poorest community in the city of Chicago. And I, I'm there for a reason, because I want to be there. And I, I know that, uh, that there is a lot of pain that goes on. There's a lot of pain that goes on between, in relationships between male and female. And, and it seems as though from your testimony that it's a lot worse than even we can imagine because of, you know, I, I'm not trying to make any excuses for anybody. But it seems to me like there's a, that women are a convenient target for black men because they can't exercise their sense of dignity and power as vis-a-vis -vis white men. Right. They can't get to white men, so they'll get to the person who's closest to them, and that is their woman. You know, and until we start dealing with the issue, really the issue of the power relationships, and get into instructing our young men, but primarily our young women, I think that's where you start at. You know, because they accept and they expect, and they, some of them, and that's not to blame them but they view it as being a mock or, or some kind of a badge of courage or badge of acceptance to be treated and ill-treated and disrespected uh, by, by I a mean, male. I see it all the time. I look out my window and I can see young women having boys pulling all over on them and cussing them and that kind of, you know, and I, don't, I, I just, I wanted to make sure that this committee uh, addresses this issue, that this committee gives voice to this problem in all of its complexities as, as, as much as possible. Because I really want this committee to, and, and the members of this committee, myself included and everybody who's participating and, and all, all those who are gathered here, I really want us to, to uh, engage uh, and being a part and become a part of the solution as opposed to being a part of the problem. This is a very serious issue that's not on most of the Congress's radar screen. You know, we're never going to be called over to vote on this issue. You know, we're, most committees will never undertake a hearing based on these kind of issues. But these are kind of issues that's tearing the fabric of our community apart. And I really Again, I want to thank you all for participating and for being a part of this hearing. And uh, thank you and I compliment you and commend you for your noble work. We've got a long way to go, and we also have a short time to get there. Thank you very much, and the committee stands adjourned.
I want to state also that the record is open uh, for 30 days for any additional questions. If we have questions, we'll send them to you in writing. Please respond promptly. Committee adjourned.